All right, now in second, what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to kind of go through, it's a little bit more similar to a Bible study. We're going to go through this 2 Corinthians chapter 8, um, verse by verse for a while, because it's, it's one main topic that we're dealing with here. And um, what I'm preaching about tonight, just so you, you keep this in mind as we're going through the chapter, is a cheerful giver. I'm going to be preaching tonight about giving. Now, I've already preached a sermon about tithes and offerings. I'm not preaching about that tonight. This is not the tithe. The tithe is something that belongs to God. It's a tenth that is God's. And we went over that in my sermon on the tithe. Malachi explains that, that look, the tithe belongs to the Lord. It's his money. So when you don't tithe, you're basically stealing from God because it's his. What I'm talking about tonight is being a cheerful giver and giving alms or giving gifts, giving things to other people that it's not a commandment. Okay, what we're preaching tonight, this is not the law. This is not something you have to do. But it's encouraged, and we're going to see why. There's, there's good reasons to be a cheerful giver and to be generous and to be liberal and to liberal in the sense of giving, you know, giving liberally, you know, applying things liberally. Like, like this, this afternoon we had... Um, our ham and cheese sandwiches, my wife was liberal with the honey mustard on them, which I love that because I love honey mustard. So that means there was plenty of honey mustard on the sandwich that you could actually taste it. It wasn't just some little small smearing of it that would not be liberal. So liberal meaning uh, the proper definition of the word liberal, which we're going to see here in uh, verse number two of 2 Corinthians 8. But that's what we're going to be preaching tonight. That's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at uh, scripture that talks about people giving. And just to give you a basic overview of this chapter, of course, this whole book of 2 Corinthians is written to the church at Corinth. So Paul's writing this epistle to the church of the Corinthians. And right here in these chapters, you know, you get the whole thing in context. We're going to go dip into chapter 9 as well because it all, it all blends together that he's, he's writing to them so that ultimately they could lay aside some money to help some other saints out, to help other people, other believers in Christ. And he's kind of going through this whole... Uh, speech, if you will, on, 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 on giving. That's what a lot of this has to do with. So let's look down at verse number one. He says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liber liberality. So he starts off talking about this church in Macedonia. And Look at verse number two. He says that how then a great trial of affliction, the abundance, so they're being afflicted, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. So they didn't have a lot, right? They were poor. They didn't, they didn't have much good, much physical good in this world. He says it abounded unto the riches of their liberality. They still were able to, to give and be liberal with what they had, even when they didn't have a lot. Now, this is where I'm going to say Dave Ramsey's got it completely wrong. Dave Ramsey, you know, I'm not, I don't endorse him. Every once in a while I listen to him. I've listened to him a bit just on drives because there's sometimes there's nothing else to listen to. You know, when I've listened to the Bible over and over again, I'll just put on something else. And, I, and I've listened to his show sometimes. But, you know, and he's got these slogans, cash is king and all this other stuff. Like, like it's not biblical. And when, when people, start, when he starts giving, you know, trying to give scriptural advice, you know, he's talking to people who are divorced and all this other stuff. It's not good. But um, one of the things that he promotes, he's saying, well, you need to get out of debt. And there's nothing wrong with getting out of debt. I agree. You should get out of debt. Okay. You shouldn't be the servant to, to the lender. And, and I, I agree with that. You know, we're striving to get out of debt. But what, one of the things they'll say is that, well, you need to accumulate this wealth so that way you can give more. And on the surface, okay, it sounds great. But see, I think he's got it wrong because I don't think that you should ever, and I don't know if he endorses this or not. So again, I don't, I don't really care about Dave Ramsey that much. I'm just kind of using him as examples, maybe something that people have listened to. Um, it sounds like he says that you need to get rich first so then you can start giving and you could give a lot. Um, I don't know if he endorses that or not of, of as far as not giving until you get rid of the debt and stuff, but that is definitely wrong. And we see here that it's not, it's not about how much money you can give. It's not. That's actually not, a, not the issue at all. 
We saw, keep your finger here and turn to Mark chapter 12. Because we saw here already that these people, their, po their deep poverty abounded, is what he's saying. Their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So even people who were deeply in, impoverished, they were not wealthy at all. They hardly had anything. They were still liberal. They're still generous. They're still hospital and, and having these types of attributes. We need to have these attributes as well. I don't care what your financial situation is in. Obviously, you can't give what you don't have, right? So I'm not saying that like, like you know, if someone needs 10 grand and you don't have it, like, well, what are you going to do? You can't, you can't help them out. You can't do that if that's, if that's the case. But what you can do is what you can do. You can help with whatever it is that you do have. Look at Mark 12. Look at verse number 41. Mark 12, 41 says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto, unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So Jesus is sitting there. He's at the treasury. He's watching people come and put their money in. Some people are coming and they're putting in a lot of money, right? And he's, he's witnessing this. He's seeing this. Saying, okay, well, there's some people who are putting a lot of money. And then he sees this lady come in and she just puts in two mites, which is like, you know, I don't know the equivalent, maybe two pennies or something, right? And in, in, in our terms, maybe two dollars, whatever that may be. It's not much, right? She just gave two mites. But who did Jesus have more respect to? Did he have respect to the person who put in, you know, all of this money? No. I mean, now, was there a problem or a sin with them giving a lot of money? No. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But what Jesus was focused on, and he points it out as I would say, you know what? This woman right here, she's put in more than everybody. Than those that put in a lot, those that put in a little, than, than everybody. Everybody that's put into this, she's put in more. And financially speaking, she probably put in the least. Jesus isn't looking for the big bucks. Jesus isn't looking for you to get rich and to have all of this money just so that you can give. Don't get sucked into that mindset because that is what Dave Ramsey is teaching and that is why he's promoting you to gain all this wealth in this world so that you can give. Jesus doesn't care about the dollar amount. That doesn't mean anything to him. God is not bound on doing great things to bring honor and glory to his name by how many dollars you put into an offering or that you give to help people out. It's not bound by dollars. God can do more with less. And, and Jesus right here is given the, the credit to this woman. It says she's cast in everything she had. And it's only two mites, but she gave it all to God. And she trusted that God can do something with that. And she had a willing heart and a humble heart to be able to do that, to, to provide that in, in, a, in an attitude that cared about other people. That's why she's putting that money in. And this is, this is the, um, it's, it's an overall mindset and attitude that we need to have. And we need to carry this out too. Be liberal with people. Be, be um, you know, generous don't be stingy and greedy and thinking you have to hoard all this money. Look, God will protect you and God will take care of you. Um, I'm not saying, again, and, and, and you've got to draw a balance here in the line, every single bum that approaches you on the street, you don't have to give them everything that you own. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, we, we ought to be helping the poor. We ought to be... To be you know, giving in the people and, and have an attitude where you're not just, just trying to keep things and keep everything for yourself, especially all the, well, just in case this and just in case that. Now, hey, I'm all for being prepared, but when someone's in need, you got to be able to let go of that. You got to be able to let go of, well, this is all my supply. What am I going to do? You know, I got, I got food for 10 years and here's someone who's hungry. You got to be willing to part with some of that. You know, I'm going to help this person out because they need it now. 
don't worry about your, you know, well, this is this is my what if savings emergency fund. This person is it needs a lot of help right now, and this is this is kind of what we're what we're um, the attitude that we need to have. Don't be so into that money or or wealth or possessions or whatever it is that you have in this world that you're not going to be ready and willing and being a cheerful giver to be able to give it unto others. Even in their in their poverty, um, they were able to to be liberal with what they had. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 again, back where we were. So flip back from Mark 14 to 2 Corinthians 8. We're going to keep reading here. Look at verse number 3. It says, For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. He's saying, look, I'm bearing record of the power that they had and beyond their power. So they went above and beyond what was even in their power, he says, they were willing of themselves. They had this mindset to do even more than what they were capable of doing. This is where their minds were. This is where their will was at, was, was to go above and beyond. They're willing of themselves. Verse number four, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And here I believe they're, they're calling you know, Paul and asking them to help them out and take upon themselves the fellowship, the working together of the ministering to the saints. They're working hard. They have what they have, but they have limited resources. They're asking for help and saying, hey, fellowship with us and the ministering to the saints and the helping other people out and helping other believers out. Verse number five and says, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So they did a great thing here. It says they, they first gave themselves to the Lord. They're saying, and this is, this is where they're forsaken the, uh, their earthly possessions. They say, it doesn't matter, God. We're giving ourselves wholly to you. What do you want us to do? do you, I mean, we have people in need here. We're going to help them out. I'm not going to worry about my own needs. I'm going to worry about theirs first because they're more important. That's the, the attitude and the mindset that they had. And, um, and it says they gave themselves unto 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 them as well, unto the you know the apostle Paul and and those he was with. He says um, they did this. They 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 were ministering to the saints and they gave themselves to the Lord. Um, let's jump down to verse number nine because we see here then Jesus is the perfect example of selflessness of someone who who did everything for the benefit of others never did anything for the benefit of, him, of himself and his ministry. There's, there's no, you know, nothing that he did was like, well, I'm just going to do this for me. <clears throat> I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a vacation. I don't want to talk to this person right now. He never did that once. Everything he did was with a purpose and it was according to God's will. It wasn't ever just, just, I need a break, I'm going to take time off, or whatever. He did everything at the expense of himself for others. Verse number 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You think about the riches and the honor and the glory that Jesus Christ had before coming to this world, when he was with the Father. Seated at the right hand of God the Father. When, when, I mean, he has all power, all riches, everything in the world and more. Yet, he became poor. He became a physical person. He became a human being and took on the form of a man so that we might be rich. Because when he died, he, he died for our sins, of course, but to, to leave us an inheritance. <coughs> remember when Jesus said that in my father's house there are many mansions and if I, if I go away I go to prepare a place for you and um, those are riches that we don't deserve those are riches that, that Jesus has, has made for us and um, the way he was able to do that was by becoming poor and he was the perfect example of, of how we ought to be Verse number 10 says, and herein I give my advice. And again, I want to point out, this isn't a commandment. This isn't something that you are commanded that you absolutely have to do, you have to give. 
This is something that, that's considered like a free will offering. This is something that you do on your own just because you want to, just because you love people, just because you want to help people out. That is, is the motivation for doing this. It is not something that you are... There's a lot of things we're commanded to do. You know, we're commanded to preach the gospel to every creature. We're commanded to get baptized. We're commanded to go to church. We're commanded to do so many things in the Christian life. But what I'm preaching about tonight, be it this, being a cheerful giver, you are not commanded that you have to do this. And that's why Paul says here, and here and I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. He's saying, it's, it's my advice, but this is good for you. It's expedient for you. This is something that will benefit you, and it, and it is good for you to do and for you to hear. Verse 11, Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. And he's calling them out. He's calling out the Corinthians saying, look, you were ready a year ago. You were ready to do this. Your will was to help. You said you wanted to help. You were ready to do this. Okay, now the time has come. Now you need to put into action what you said you wanted to do and you were willing to do. And see, this is where the, where the rubber hits the road. It's easy for us to say because it sounds great. And, and who doesn't want to be a good person and give to people? You know, what Christian doesn't want to have that type of an attitude? And of course we want that. But it's a whole other story when it comes down to actually doing it. Think about the excuse. I think about the excuses in my own life. I could come up with, I mean, financially, we're, <laughs> on one hand, we're doing excellent. On the other hand, we're down in the dumps, right? It all depends on my perspective on how you're going to look in this. We've got debt. We've got these problems. We've got a lot of other stuff, but, but look at what we have. And, and this is the mindset that we need, we need to understand is that, look, depending on how you look at your situation, you could always think that you'd never have any money and you're always poor and you never have anything. <clears throat> but that's because you're not looking at the things you actually have. And it would be easy for me to say, well, we can't afford to give anything to anybody. I can't afford it. I mean, I've got these bills, I've got kids to feed, I've got all this other. I can't afford to give anything to anybody. Yet, I've got two vehicles, a house, you know, whatever other things, furniture and things that we have. You know, it's easy to get to get into this mindset of just looking at your income and looking at bills and outgoing and stuff and just saying, well, I don't have anything. I, I can't give anything. And what that is, is that just means, well, no, this is mine and this is mine and this is mine and this is mine and this is mine. Well, I can't get rid of any of this because it's all mine. And, and really, that's what it boils down to. And, and you, have, you have people who honestly like, would feel like they want to give. And then they jump on this bandwagon of thinking like, well, no, I just, apparently I just have to make a lot of money then in order to be able to give. And that is, don't, don't get caught down that trap because that is not the right attitude at all. Jesus didn't have nearly as much respect to those people that gave of their abundance. He says, well, yeah, these people gave a lot because they have a lot. I mean, yeah, sure, if you have a lot of money, sure, you could give a lot. That's not really going to, going to much of a sacrifice. That's not something that, I mean, do it, you know, there's, he's not condemning them for, do it, for doing it. But he gave the respect unto the one who, who didn't have anything and gave what you had. And if you want God to look at you and have respect unto the free will offerings that you're going to give, if you're going to help people out... Let them look on what, on what you don't have and then say, or what you do have and say, well, wow, this person's willing to give up all of this other stuff. I remember there's one moment in my life, and I'm not going to go into details about it because I don't want to really draw much attention to myself, but I was faced with this, with this very thing where there was someone who was in need and had, a, and had a great need. And it was really going to hurt me in order to help that person out. And it's... Uh, <laughs> that's really a moment when, when you start to think like, well, am I really going to do this now? Because it's easy to say, oh yeah, brother, you know, if you're in help, if you're in need, I will do anything for you. You know, I'll sell my vehicle. I'll do, I'll take out a loan, whatever I need to do, you know, whatever it is to help you out. I'll do that for you. If you're, if you're in that time of need, it sounds great. And, and you know what? I wish people had that type of an attitude anyways, and we should have those types of attitudes. But when it actually comes down to it, when the situation arises, you need to be willing then to, to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, and, and help people out. 
And that's exactly what Paul is explaining here to him. He's that your readiness to will, you know, a year ago, in verse number 11, he says, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. He's saying, okay, well, I want to see you do it. I mean, wh whatever it is that you have, whatever you're able to do, now let's see you do it. You need, you need to help out here. And um, we ought to be ready to do that at, at any moment. And, and be settled in your heart that, you know what? I don't care about these things. Because here's ultimately what the what's important to understand is that God can see what you've done and let's say there is some let's just say someone I'll just I'll just make something up because I because I don't have this you know whatever it, someone needed like 10 grand for some reason I mean some health reason or something like that I could probably sell things myself you know whatever do some things to come up with that money to help that person out they didn't have anything and I needed to help them God can look at that and say, you know what? I like that the fact that you're giving and maybe he could make something else in my, some other debt go away. He could, you know, he could cause something to come back to, you know, whatever. If, if, if I was then left in need because I had to give something that I had to help someone else out, God will see that and he'll make sure that I have what I need. Now, maybe I won't have all my luxury. I'm not promising that, oh, you give up some luxuries. God's just going to give you even more luxuries. But if you, have a real, if you have a need and you have to give up something that's going to impact that, then I fully believe that God will look on that and He'll bless you for that. And He'll still take care of you. If you're doing good, if you're helping other people out, He will take care of you. And that's the bottom line. And we need to have that level of faith to say, okay, this is going to hurt me quite a bit, but I'm just going to do it anyways because I love that person and I care about them and I'm going to do something to help them out. And if that means I have to give up some material possessions that I have, then so be it. Because it's all going to burn up and get perished anyways with this whole world. I'd rather look for my eternal rewards in heaven. And, and I believe you will get eternal rewards in heaven for doing that, for helping people in their time of need, for clothing people when they're naked and visiting them when they're in prison and doing all these things that Jesus listed off. Um, <clears throat> in... I forget what chapter that was of uh, Matthew, but let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 12. Second Corinthians 8, 12 says, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by inequality that now at this time your abundance may supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. So he's basically kind of saying, you know, it's according to what you have. It's not, I'm not asking you to do more than you're capable of doing. I'm also not just picking on you and that you just have to always be footing the bill for everyone else. He's saying that, that there should be an equality here that look, you're in a time of abundance. You have this stuff. Well, hey, they're in a time of lack. Help them out. And then when you're in a time of need, when you're in a time of want, and they're in a time of abundance, and they'll come and help you out. It'll work itself out. There'll be an equality. Verse number 15 says, As it is written, He that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. So he's, he's applying this to the collection of the manna that God promised to take care of and to feed the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. And he fed them with manna and said that, you know, some people went out and they gathered a lot. Some people didn't gather that much, but they all had what they needed. So the same way with the churches and with the saints. Some people might be blessed and they have abundance of things and other people don't have very much. What he's saying is that, you know, the person who's in abundance can help to be a supply for those that, that have a lack so that there's an equality, so that nobody lacks, so that everybody has exactly what they need. Um, let's jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1 says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you, to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. So again, he's talking to the Corinthians, saying, you know, touching the ministering to the saints, helping out, ministering to them. 
He's like, it's superfluous for me to write for you because I know that your mind was ready. He says, and I boast of you. He said, I know that you are willing, you're ready to help. I know the forwardness of your mind. And he's like, I, I even boasted of you to them in Macedonia, saying, hey, yeah, those Corinth, that church at Corinth, they're ready to go. They're ready to, to, to help people out in need. And he um, says that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. He's saying, so because of that, it's, it's provoked many other people to, to follow suit, to do likewise. They have the same type of an attitude. Verse number three he says, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. So he's saying, But I sent some people to you basically in advance so that everything that we were saying about you isn't just in vain, that you actually are going to follow through with what you had said before. He says in this behalf, That as I said, you may be ready. So he's like, I'm giving you a fair warning. I sent some people to say, Okay, remember you had said you'd be willing to do this before. Now there's a time of need. He kind of gave them a, a warning so he didn't just spring it on them all at once, but that they could just make sure that their hearts are right and that they're ready to do this. He says in verse 4, Lest haply if they have Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. So he's saying, look, We've been boasting about you that you're this great church, that you're willing to help people out, that you're willing to supply needs and with your abundance, with the things that you have, you are willing to give that up for people in need. So he's saying, I want to give you this warning because I don't want to show up with people from Macedonia and then you're not ready and you're not able to help like, like you said you were able to do. Um, so he gave him that fair warning. Verse number five says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So he's saying, you know, the bounty just make up that collection so that everything's ready to go. So when they show up, whatever the, the need happens to be, they don't spell it out exactly what it is, but whatever the, the, the amount of um, help that they needed, would be ready for them to go and that they could deal with their church and taking up collections or whatever they needed to do to help out these other saints in Macedonia. And he says it's a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. Now, um, let's keep reading here, verse number six. He says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And Again, we're, I mean, Macedon, the church of Macedonia is a good church. They were ministering to the saints. They were doing good work, but now they need some help, right? This is a soul winning church. This is a church that's doing the works for God, but they're having some, some struggles. Financially, they're having some problems. And what he's saying here is that, you know, when you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you, don't, if you don't give that much seed out, I mean, think about the illustration, right? If you're, if you're sowing seed of um, whatever, fruit or vegetables, the less seeds that you throw down on the ground, well, you're not going to get as much of a harvest. There's going to be less plants that grow as a result. But if you're pretty liberal with the amount of seeds that you're throwing down, well, guess what? You're going to get a lot more growth from that, a lot more fruit and a lot more results. So he's, he's saying that, you know, be liberal, be generous with what you're giving. You know, if they need help, get, you know, give them what they need and you know, give them some more. If, you, if you're willing to give like that, you'll produce that much more fruit. They'll be able to do that much more work and reach that many more people and, and the fruit will abound. He's saying in verse 7, he says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And this comes to the heart of what I'm preaching about today. He says, look, it's up to you. Every man, according as you purpose in your own heart. And he just got done explaining that parable. That, you know, like, look, if, you, if you're going to give generously, it's going to come back. You're going to reap uh, fruit from that. But if you give sparingly, well, you know, you're going to reap sparingly also. And he says, it's up to you. Whatever you want to do, whatever your heart, whatever you want to do in your heart, Whatever you feel like you want to do for people, so let them give. But don't do it grudging. Don't be like, man, this is really going to hurt me and I don't want to do this. And 
But I guess I said I would do it. So here and just be real grudgingly and give that money up. Just, just like hating it. Just don't do it at all then. If that's your attitude, you're probably better not to give at all. He says, I don't know, not grudgingly or of necessity, like, oh, there's something I have to do, so I guess I'm just going to give it. He says, God loveth a cheerful giver. You should be happy about it. And, and think about this. When you're giving gifts, you ought to be happy about it. When you're helping people out, that is something that ought to give you joy. The Bible says in Acts 20, verse 35, it says, I have showed you all things how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. There is a blessing in giving. When you're able to help someone out, I mean, think about someone in their, in their time of trouble or time of need. You being able to step in and just say, here you go. The weight that's lifted off of your friend, your loved one's shoulders because you were able to step in and help that to go away and help that problem that they were having ought to bring you a lot of joy. If you truly love and care about those people, that will give you way more joy than any gift that you can receive from somebody else. I've been on both ends of this, of this scenario, and I've received some very, very nice gifts from people. Very expensive, you know, nice things. And I'm always thankful for it. It's great. But I'll tell you what, it's so much better. And not just when you could give a, a fancy gift because you have a lot of money and it's just like, oh, okay, here you go. And you give some fancy gift to someone and they're not even in need. Hey, again, there's nothing wrong with that. But the joy and the satisfaction and, and, and everything else that you get from, from giving to someone, when you give to someone who's already in abundance and they don't really need anything, great. You know, you want to show them you love them, give them a gift, there's no problem with that. But when you can help someone out when they're in a time of need and when they, when they really need help and you can just completely provide for that and just say, here you go, it's a gift, thanks, you, know, you don't have to pay me back, don't worry about it, you're good, you're covered. And... and the relief that brings that person is great. And, and it truly is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm preaching a sermon is because we're coming up to Christmas. It's November 30th. We got Christmas and just a few weeks away. And people get in this mindset of focusing on what gifts am I going to get? And they start focusing on themselves. And, oh, I'm going to make my wishes. And, oh, wouldn't it be great if I get this and I get this and I get that for Christmas? And on the flip side, you start thinking like, well, I have to give gifts for, for everybody, so let's just, whatever, let's just give them this, I don't know. And they're giving grudgingly, out of necessity, thinking that, well, I have to give people gifts. Those are both wrong attitudes to have. Look, if you're going to give someone a gift, give it to them because you love them. Give it to them. Maybe they have a need somewhere. Maybe they're, they're wanting on something, and you can just be like, here you go. I love you. Here, here's a gift. This is the attitude that we ought to have. And you know, honestly, people are going to appreciate your gift a lot more when it means something to them. When you could, when you could look at them and say, hey, I know, because in order to know what a person's needs are, you need to like talk to them and know a little bit about them. And it'll be that much more personal when you could be giving a gift like that where the person could say, wow, you know, this person's really thinking about me. I really needed this. They recognized that. They were able to identify that without asking for my wish list of things that I want. They actually took the time to speak to me, to talk to me, and know the things that, that I could use and got me this gift. And you know what? Maybe it's not the most expensive thing. Maybe it's something that's handmade. Those gifts, I, I guarantee you, are always going to be received the best. They're going to mean the most to somebody. They ought to. If your heart's right, they will. But, but even, even when people's hearts aren't right, usually that, that will touch a nerve and people will feel that gift and, um, and it'll be better for everyone involved. Don't give out like grudgingly or anything like that. Um, be a cheerful giver. The Bible says in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So he's saying, look, God's able to make all grace abound toward you. He's like, he's, he's able to take care of you with everything. If you're willing to give, if you're willing to be a cheerful giver, he'll make sure that you have what is sufficiency, what, what is sufficient for you to have. 
And again, it doesn't say he's going to just, just overwhelm you with all this abundance of wealth, but he will provide for you. He will make sure you have what is sufficient that you can abound to every good work. He'll make sure that if you need to go out and do good works, he'll take care of you. He'll make sure that there's a way for you to do that. Verse number nine, as it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So the person who's giving the seed to the sowers, you know, the God gives us the seed. God's able to bless that and make sure that that we're fed that you know we're taken care of and that every if we're giving it all we have that the seed that's that's sown can be blessed also and that could bring forth abundantly um verse number 11 being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving to god for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto god whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. God has given us a gift and we ought to be able to give gifts unto others. Now, um, the Bible says in Matthew 6, flip there if you'd like, flip to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be done in 2 Corinthians 8. Just a few other aspects of, of giving gifts or giving alms. Well, the Bible talks about alms. We'll see. Um, we'll get into that in just a minute. You're in Matthew 6. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So the Bible's telling us, look, when you give, when you give alms, when you give like charitable giving to people that's going to help people out directly, that are in a time of need, the, the exact situations that we're talking about tonight, God will reward you for that. God will bless you for doing those things. But he's saying, don't sound the trumpet. Don't be like, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm giving all this money to this charity. I'm donating it over here and post it up on Facebook. And be like, I just donated this much money to this cause. Because he's saying, well, then you got your reward right there because everyone's going to see that and be like, oh, what a great person. What a great guy. Oh, you know, and lift up you for being so great because you gave all this money. He's saying, don't be like that. Don't be the hypocrite. Don't be like these Pharisees. I want everyone to see how great and how special they are. That the, you know, that's, if that's the reason why you're giving, then, then your heart's in the wrong place and then you are just getting your reward by doing that. He's saying, look, you should be giving because you care about it. You want to help people out. You don't need to draw attention to you. You can do it meekly, humbly, and even anonym, anonymously and giving that gift. And you know what? God sees that and God will reward you in due time for doing things like that. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 3. I'm going to read from Luke 12 for you. Luke 12, 33 says, Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, nor moth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. A great um, understanding here of, he's saying, look, sell what you have and give alms. He's saying, forget about your possessions, sell them, give alms. That way you're going to have bags that can hold your treasure that don't get old. You're not going to lose this stuff because the treasure you'll receive by getting rid of your, your worldly possessions and focusing on the, the important stuff, on helping others out and being ministering unto others, that 
cannot be corrupted. That is something that is eternal and has eternal value. And then he warns, says, look, where your treasure is there, will your heart be also. If, you're, if your heart is on your treasures of this world, well, you're not going to be wanting to give anything to anybody because you're going to be too focused on what you have here instead of focused on what you have in heaven. If you're focused on what you have in heaven, then when someone comes to you with a need, you're going to be thinking, great, yeah, who cares? I can get rid of this stuff right now. There you go. Take it. I don't need it. I'm focused on my, on, on my heavenly rewards. I'm not focused on this stuff. It doesn't mean anything to me. Go ahead. You need it, take it. It's yours. Look at verse X number 3. We're going to see a little bit of a definition of what alms even are. We're almost done. Acts 3, look at verse number 2. It says, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So here we see a man, he's lame. He's unable to work. Now the Bible teaches that, you know, if a man shall not work, neither shall he eat. That we need to just, you can't just be a lazy bum and expect to just get money for nothing when you're not willing to go out and work a full day's labor and pay for yourself so that you're not worse than an infidel, that you could provide for yourself and for your family. But there are some people in this world that are incapable of working. And that's what we see here. A man is lame. He's not able to walk. There's not many jobs that he's going to be able to get as a lame person. So what he had to do was just ask for mercy of people that could see his situation, could understand and say, okay, well, here's a man. He can't go out and work. So he's just relying on people at church to help him out. And this is what the alms are. He, was, he says he's lame from his mother's womb. It's not even a result of his own sin. This is something that just happened to him. I was born like this. I can't work because I'm lame. I can't walk. I can't do anything. So he's, he's sitting there. He's asking for people to help him. And he's asking alms. And that's what alms are when you're helping somebody out that has a need. And it's a legitimate need. It's not that he's some drunk or some druggie that just wants to go and booze it up and, and shoot up some heroin or whatever and just waste everything that they have and not go to work because they're a worthless piece of trash that, that just doesn't have any character whatsoever that, that doesn't want to work for themselves but wants to freeload off everyone else. That's not this type of person. This is a type of person who's in, who's in need. And um, that's what giving alms is. And look what happens here in verse 4. It says, or in verse 3, it says, Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So he's asking them for some help, for some money. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And I want to point out to you, he said, look, I don't have any money. I don't have silver and gold. But what I do have, I'm going to give that unto you. I can see you're in need. Now, obviously here he was able to perform a miracle. And God was able to heal that man. I'm not saying that you have that power to go up to someone and, and just heal people. Okay, but what I want to point out is that it's the answer isn't always money. Okay, his problem, money helped him because he couldn't work and he needed to survive. So, so giving him money did help, but he was able to be helped a lot more through this healing. So you can say, well, look, I really don't have much money at all. Like, I, I'm really poor. I really don't have anything. You can still help people out in different ways. You can, you can sacrifice time. You can sacrifice other things to give to somebody that it doesn't necessarily have to be money. Money is kind of easy. It's tangible. It can, it can help in a variety of ways. It's, it's something that you can, you can use that way, and there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the point I want to make here is that, look, they didn't have any money, yet they were able to help this man. He says, look, that what I do have, I'll help you out with. And if you have that type of a willingness and say, well, you know, I really don't have a lot. I, I don't have a lot of money. There's, there's, there's almost no money that I have. If that situation applies to you, well, think about what you do have. 
What do I have that can help this person out? That's a need. Maybe you have a certain skill. Maybe they have a need. Maybe their, you know, their roof is collapsing on their home and they're really poor and they don't have any money and they're looking, they need some help. You say, hey, you know what? I know how to fix that. I can help you out with that. I'll devote some of my time. Whatever it may be. I mean, there's, there's so many different things of, in ways we could help people out. And we need to just, just have this type of an attitude. Now, um, the last place we're going to turn is Esther chapter 9. And we're going to see an example in Esther 9 of people giving gifts in the Bible. And, you know, there's people every year around Christmas time, they'll say how wicked it is and how pagan it is to celebrate Christmas and all this other stuff. And they kind of want to be like the Jehovah's Witnesses that don't celebrate anything. And um, it mostly comes out of this Hebrews Roots movement, which wants to go back to, to everything of the ways of the Old Testament and do the animal sacrifices and everything else, which is just completely untrue. Most of them aren't saved, which is why they don't understand Scripture, and they get into this false doctrine. But giving gifts to people, there is nothing wrong with that. Celebrating the, the birth of Jesus Christ, yeah, you know what? Was he born on December 25th? Probably not. Do I believe that Jesus was born on December 25th? No, probably not. I don't think he was. But I don't know when he was born. So if we celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th, Great. There's nothing wrong with selling. Now, do you have to celebrate Christmas? No. Is it a commandment? No. But are people wrong for celebrating Christmas? No. You know, one, one man esteemeth one day above another, another man esteemeth all days alike. That's what the Bible says. Okay? If you esteem a day, you know, esteem it unto the Lord. If you don't esteem a day, then unto the Lord don't, don't esteem it. That's, that's fine. It's, that's do whatever you want to do. But um, I'm not going to be bound by people saying, oh, you can't celebrate Christmas as pagan, whatever. And giving gifts, there's nothing wrong with it. And let's look at Esther chapter 9. Look at verse number 19. Obviously, you give people gifts because you love them. But another, another reason that people give gifts is just in celebration. And that's kind of what Christmas is about. We're celebrating. We're celebrating the birth of our Savior, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and paid for all of our sins. So we celebrate that by giving gifts to people because it's, it's a time of joy and merriment and, and time where we come together and show love for people and say, hey, I love you. Here's a free gift. Look at verse number 19 of Esther 9. It says, Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day and of sending portions one to another and Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus both nigh and far to establish this among them that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. So he's saying, you know, this was, if you don't know the story of Esther, the Mordecai and the Jews, there was uh, Haman hated the Jews. He hated Mordecai and he put out a decree basically that they'd all just be killed and put to death because he hated them so much. And then, you know, Esther goes to the king. There's this whole story. God basically intervenes and, and Esther goes to the king and, and um, Haman gets killed and put to death and the Jews are allowed to stand up and to fight for themselves and God delivers them out of the hands of all their enemies of the people who wanted to kill them. So it's a great day for celebration because they defeated their enemies. They're, they're safe now from the evil that was prepared against them. And Mordecai says, okay, because of this, because we're so thankful, because it was such a great event for us, God took care of us, we're going to establish these two days and we're going to celebrate. And, you know, it's a time of great joy. We're going to have feasting. We're going to have people over. We're going to eat good meals. We're going to send portions one to another and we're going to give gifts to the poor. We're going to help people out that are needy. Was that a commandment from God? No. He started a tradition of man. Not all traditions are evil. 
Just because someone has a tradition doesn't make it automatically bad or wicked or pagan or anything. It's just a tradition. Now, if you start replacing the word of God or, the, or start teaching a tradition as a commandment from God, that's wrong and that's a sin. But that's not what happened here. They're just acknowledging, hey, let's celebrate these days because they mean a lot to us. And one of the ways that they do that is by giving gifts which is exactly what we do at Christmas time. And this is what we need to be more focused on because we're in a commercialized society that tries to tell you that you need to buy things to be happy, you, you're under obligation to give gifts to everybody and their mother, and that you have to stress about this and how you're going to pay for everything. No, don't get that attitude. That is not what Christmas is about at all. It's not the way it should be at all. It's about celebrating, being joyful, feasting over the fact that Christ was born and paid for our sins. And if you want to give gifts to someone, great. And if you, whatever you can do, you can do. And you ought to have a cheerful attitude. You ought to be cheerful about giving. And you know what? This isn't just for Christmas, by the way, either. I mean, this is for all times of your life. It just seems to be a, a more of a focus at this time of year. But don't forget the poor this holiday season either. And, and, and we're going to do something special this year so that we don't lose sight of the poor and the needy. Because that's one of the examples we have here in Esther 9. That's exactly what they did. They gave gifts unto the poor. And um, I believe that, that we need to be doing the same thing and keep our hearts right and being able to look and have compassion on people that are in need and, and to provide for them and to help provide for them um, and, and give them some type of a blessing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your words and for the great gift that you've given us, that unspeakable gift of salvation, dear Lord. You've done so much for us. Help us to be able to show our gratitude and our love for you and um, the thankfulness for the abundance of, of possessions or things that we have in our life and be able to not be focused on those things, dear Lord, but to be able to part with them at a moment's notice and not care about it and not be caught up in the treasures of this world, dear Lord, but, but to be willing to give cheerfully and be happy about supplying the needs of others, dear Lord, especially of the saints and of other people that are godly people that are in need, dear Lord. Help us to be able to, to give appropriately, to have the right hearts, and to not worry about the, the treasures of this earth, but have our hearts and minds focused on the treasures which are in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.